I'm Dr. Vaughn Starnes. I'm the uh, professor and chair of surgery at uh, USC School of Medicine. You're now listening to the interview with a surgeon with a surgeon agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Vaughn Starnes, Chair of the Department of Surgery at USC. As a founding executive director of the USC Cardiovascular Thoracic Institute, Dr. Starnes has built an interdisciplinary powerhouse comprised of clinicians and basic scientists who are exploring better and more innovative ways of treating heart disease. Under his leadership, USC surgeons have conducted more than 15,000 open heart surgeries to repair and replace valves or correct coronary artery bypasses, and more than 10,000 surgeries for disease of the lungs, esophagus, and chest wall. Dr. Dr. Starnes pioneered the living-related double lumbar lung transplant in 1993. He and his surgical team also performed Southern California's first robotic heart operation in 2001 as part of the clinical trial evaluating the use of a remote surgical system. In 2019, Dr. Starnes served as the 100th president of the American Association for Thoracic Surgery. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Vaughn Starnes, Chair of Surgery at USC. Doc, how are we doing today? We're doing great, Matthew. How are you? Doing good. Thank you for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how did those change during your fellowship? Well, you know, in my residency program, I was just wanting to be the very best surgeon I could be. So I really honed my skills, not only my technical skills, but my base of knowledge uh, and hoping that that would in turn lead me to an uh, excellent fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery, which was my ultimate goal. When I trained, you had to do six, seven years of general surgery before you could apply to a fellowship. Of course, that has changed today. Uh, we accepting uh, residents or actual medical students right into our I-6 or our cardiac program that has six years of training, whereas I went through 11 years before I got my uh, independency to, to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. So kind of taking us through your fellowship year, what was your mentality heading into your first job search? And how did that perspective change the beginning years of your career? Well, you know, I uh, I had the opportunity to train at Stanford with one of the leading icons in cardiothoracic surgery at that time, Norman Shumway, who did the first transplant in the United States, uh, adult successful transplant. So I knew right away I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon, trained under him, and learn about transplantation. So from the get-go, I wanted to be really an academic surgeon. And uh, in that program, I, uh, I, I... thrived and I was very, very successful as a resident uh, to the point I was offered a faculty job at Stanford. Uh, and I also wanted to do pediatric surgery. So Dr. Shumway sent me to London for uh, a year to train in pediatric heart surgery, brought me back to Stanford as a faculty member. So my job search was pretty short. I, I was hired right where I trained, which I know a lot of people do, do not have that opportunity, but I did. So thinking about that, did you ever consider going to private practice or are you academic focused all the way? I was pretty much academic focused all the way. I never really looked at any private jobs. Uh, I did look at one in Texas where a good friend of mine in medical school was a cardiothoracic surgeon in Dallas, but uh, that was at the same time that I was offered a faculty position at Stanford and I never looked back. And I really, I've really enjoyed my, my career in academic surgery. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climb to the top of your industry? Well, I think it's key for anyone starting out to have great mentors. And I had uh, not only Dr. Shumway, but I had several mentors at Stanford that really focused my interest in my path in which I took. And I really think it takes that, that person that you look up to to really help you along the way and sort of keep you out of uh, – areas that you could get diverted or you lose your focus. And so mentors are really important. Uh, and I would really encourage any young surgeon starting out to really look to a mentor, someone he respects or she respects, uh, because I think it's, it's, a, it's a brave new world out there and things have changed dramatically since even I trained. What type of advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Well, I think number one, you ought to you ought to pick a job that that you really, really want to practice professionally. You want to love that job. You know, regardless of the money, the money always ends up being a afterthought once you're into a job. And once you're into a job, you're either happy in that job or you're going to be miserable. It's never about the money at that point. So take the money off the table when you're looking at that job, and look at the people you'll be practicing with. 
Look at the type of practice they want you to perform. Is it it's in a space that you're going to be happy doing? It's a space that you're comfortable doing because you want to be the very best you can be when you're in, in practice. And I think that's, that's the key to success uh, long term. Seeing that a lot of these annual conferences are being done virtually or online this year, what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process? Well, I think it's even more important now, uh, Matthew, because as you say, our annual meetings where we did a lot of interaction and, and a lot of uh, networking uh, are just not being held, but they are being held virtually. And I would encourage all of our residents to get on those virtual formats and sort of see who's out there, who's talking about areas of their interest and actually pick up a phone and call them. No one's going to uh, not take your call because we're all interested in all the young surgeons coming through now. And we know it's a difficult time and we'll go out of our way to help anybody that reaches out to us. Can you talk about your involvement with the American Association of Thoracic Surgery? Yeah, that was sort of the, uh, the if you were the pinnacle of my career, you know, it's sort of uh, the, is the top job that you can get as a cardiothoracic surgeon in academics. Uh, it was it was a very nice honor because it's really bestowed on you by your colleagues who say to you, we've respected all the things that you've done in practice. Uh, we think you're one of the leading cardiothoracic surgeons in, in our country, if not internationally. And, uh, and you get the opportunity to lead that organization and sort of set, set the pathway forward for young investigators and uh, young physicians coming into the field. There's a human element to being a surgeon. All of your experience and everything you've gone through, what advice would you have given your younger self when dealing with situations in the OR that don't come out as favorable as you'd like? Well, I think it comes back to your training. You have to assume that you've had the very best training possible and you are uh, as good as anyone else in dealing with this particular problem. You know, we're all gonna have unfortunate cases uh, and you just got to believe you did everything that you possibly could and that anyone in a similar circumstance would not have done anything differently. You got to have that confidence. Whatever you did for that patient was the very best that could have been given to that patient. And sometimes disease wins. The thing I would add, Matthew, is that it's so important with the limitations in training hours, 80 hour work week, that they really focus on getting the very best training they possibly can and stay focused because right now there's a lot of diversions there's covid there's uh, uh, diversity and gender issues out there there i mean there's a lot of social issues that are impacting a residency training right now and i think a resident really has to stay focused right now because this is the most critical period of time that they're preparing for their future and it's it's already been limited by the 80 hour work week and now we got these other factors coming in so even more so stay focused we hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.